publications or what we mean by scholarly publications. Once we have an idea of what scholarly publication is, and we also discussed about how to title and we had few exercises. Uh, the next thing what we should do is, uh, now if this is an opportunity for you to convince your readers that why your research is important. Now, how do you say your research is important? Uh, so you need to have a good introduction in your research paper. That will tell how your research is important. So what is a good introduction? A good introduction in your research paper will answer the following questions. One, what is the problem you're solving? Now, when we say problem, the word problem is used here loosely. Problem doesn't mean necessarily in terms of a mathematical problem. It can be an issue. It can be something which the organization is facing a, a difficulty, or it can be a, a foreseeable, a futuristic uh, problem which the society can face. So you are going to address an issue which needs to be better optimized. And for that problem you want to solve, do you have what we call as existing solution? Sometimes solutions are already there. So there is no point in reinventing the wheel if the solution is already there. But if the existing solutions are not able to solve the problem or they do not meet all the problems, then it is good to think of doing research to get a new, a new solution. And then you may have various solutions also. Sometimes you have various solutions. So you must you may need to do research to identify which is the best solution. Now, when you're doing the research, it cannot be very comprehensive. It will always be that, uh, you know, there will be some limitations in the research you do. So you must know the limitations of your research and also what your research intends to achieve. That means what is the significance of your research? So your significance of the research will also help you to understand what are the limitations of the research. Now, when you submit a, a proposal or a, what do you call as a manuscript uh, to a journal, editors like to see that you provide a perspective which is consistent with the nature, with their journal's nature. Now, that is why yesterday I was telling very categorically that when you want to publish in a refereed journal, it's very important you do your homework. Understand the journal, understands its objective, understands its core theme, because the title of the journal sometimes itself tells you themes. Like for example, if you say Journal of Management Science, it will cover a lot of things. If you say Journal of Knowledge Systems, it will cover a lot of things. But if you say, Journal of Human Resource Management. Now, human resource management is the boundary of that journal. So you must be able to link your paper or your manuscript or your research to the perspective which is consistent with the journal. Otherwise, what happens, even if it's a good research and even if it's a good manuscript, when you send, it will be rejected at the desk itself. It will be said as desk rejection because it does not fit the theme of the journal. When you are doing introduction, you must also have certain core literature review citation in that to support why your research has a legacy. That means your research is having certain background. And you must make sure that your citations include recent citations, unless it is a seminal work. For example, if you are stating something of innovation theory, then Rogers innovation theory, diffusion of innovation theory is okay. Or if you are stating, say, for example, the resource-based view, then Barney's grant theory of 1991 is okay. Or if you are talking about uh, principles of punishment, something, then Henry Foyle 1872 is okay. But unless it's a seminal work, you need to make sure that your introduction has recent references. And then you must also make sure there should not be improper citations because or irrelevant references because that also clouds your judgment and the editors will then think that you don't have a purpose in your um, the thing what do you say 
uh, you don't have a purpose in um, your research paper you want to do. So this is very important for you to understand. So this is what your introduction should cover. Now, once your introduction is covered, then what is the next thing? So what are the main elements of the introduction section? Now, as I said, uh, unfortunately, we couldn't do PPT, but otherwise, there's a very good diagram in the PPT, which is sent to you all this thing. Uh, you would have received through your uh, this thing, uh, uh, WhatsApp. In that, there's a very good diagram which shows what are the main elements of introduction section. The first one is you should care about this research because this research is important. So it answers the question, show what? So whenever a researcher says, uh, I want to do this, or I'm talking about this, the question immediately asks you, so what? Why are you talking about it? How does it make a difference? Then second is what has already known about the topic. As I told, the background is very important. Then what's not known, that is where the gap is, or that is where you can answer the question problem, or you can identify the issue in that gap. Third, why is it important to get new information? Why do you need research to fill this? And fifth is research aim. Now, this is a reverse triangle. So when you follow the steps, you will get what we call as ultimately what should be the research aim of your objective. Some of these elements will overlap. But by and large, your steps, so what? Then what is known about the topic? what's not known about the topic and why it is important to, to get this, what is not known about the topic, we decide what your research aim is. Then once, now generally, what are the pitfalls in and uh, when the introduction section? What, what are the general mistakes people do when giving an introduction section? Introduction is generally very generic and not written for a specific journal. Then, the recommendation table says that that's what I've been saying. Choose a specific journal, target the journal, target that re readers, and make sure that you write which is in sync with that journal objective. Citations are inadequate to support. Make sure that any claim you make is well cited. No point in saying that leadership is very important to achieve objectives. Who says so? So you must give citations for this that do citations of all the researchers who have established that leadership is important for achieving the goals of the organization. And then your research aim must be uh, clear. Research aim is vague. So include enough information and key elements. Make sure your variables are clear. So your research question must be crystal clear. The main research question should be, what is the role of leadership in the data management area. What is the role of leadership to achieve sustainability? So that clarity should be there in your research question. Now, some additional tips for this introduction are, don't write too much. Many a times we write more, we use more words than necessary. So it's good to be concise and precise. Then don't make this section into a history lesson. I mean, don't give too much of background, long introduction, and you must never have long sentences. The thumb rule is no sentence should be more than eight to 10 words. No paragraph should be more than eight to 10 sentences. That's the right way of doing a research work. Then we all know that in a research, people, any researcher is keen to present new data. So, but do not forget that you need to have the whole picture before. So whenever you want to present a data, make sure you have the data in its right form, a table, a graph, or a paragraph discussion. The introduction must be organized from global to a particular point of view, guiding the readers to your objectives. That means you begin from generic, like for example, I said, leadership in general, then types of leadership, then how transformational leadership will help in achieving sustainability. You can't suddenly jump into transformational leadership and people don't understand where you are going and where you're coming from. State the purpose of the paper and research strategy adopted to answer the question. Always keep separate and ensure manuscript flow logically from one section to next. Hypothesis and objectives must be clearly remarked 
at the end of the introduction. So a good introduction must end by clearly stating the objectives, including hypothesis, if any. And avoid using expressions such as novel, first time, first ever, uh, paradigm shift. Then they should be used sparingly. Never say that your research is pathbreaking or it's novel or nobody has done before. Such claims ca cannot stand test of time. So it is better to avoid such phrases. Now, once you have understood, these are the three slides covering introduction. The next important part in your research paper is the methods, the research methods. Now, what is the purpose of this methods? It is twofold. It is to explain how the study was done and also to enable its replication if required and to provide enough contextual data to enable readers to understand and interpret the result. So methods, the, the purpose of giving the research methods in the paper is that you contextualize the study and if others want to do similar study with different area, different region, different variables, it is possible. And also the readers can contextualize and interpret and understand the data. The essential elements in the method section are description of the setting and the participants, study design, timing, sampling, including population, data collection process, the data set, what are the dependent independent variables, covariates, if any, whether it's an article, analytical approach or a conceptual approach, and then the ethical approval. So research methodology follows a standard pattern. So this your method section must have all this briefly mentioned. And the hallmark of an exemplary method section is the justification why a particular method is used. Like yesterday, we were discussing case method. Now, case method is the right method if you want to study a single unit in detail. So if you are studying an organizational issue or an organizational problem, then case study is the right method because it helps you to delve into it seriously and holistically. So the method section must last part justify the method you are using with respect to the research paper you are submitting. Now, what are generally the pitfalls in the method section? Generally, the author describes only the methods for one study aim. Make sure that the methods are complement. Be sure to check methods describe all the aspects of the study you report, including limitation, etc. If there is no enough justification for the methods used, then also there is a question mark on the research method. So justify each approach, each variable, why you are using a particular variable, why you are using a particular method, why your sample is so much if it's quantitative which is the formula you have used to get a quantitative sample if it is a qualitative then what is that limit or how have you achieved the saturation and what is the triangulation methods you have used what is the test of reliability validity of data etc so you need to include all these things so that the research methods section is scientific logical and convincing so now we move to the next, which is the heart of the research paper. That's a discussion. Now, many people are always wondering where we should put where. Generally, we have introduction, then we have the literature review, and then we move towards methods, and then we go towards discussion. Now, discussion is what? Discussion is you must explain what your findings are and what the results mean. It is actually an easy section to write, but very hard to get it correct. Because sometimes discussion means the researchers tend to discuss many things, but that is not the thing. The discussion pertains to your findings and to the research objective. Remember that. That's the boundary of the discussion section. You must take into account the huge number of manuscripts are rejected because discussion is weak. Many of the manuscripts, I think a study has shown that around 70% of the manuscripts which are rejected is because the discussion is weak. When you say weak, it means that it is not relevant. It is not as per the methodology and the findings and as per the data. So you need to make sure that the discussion corresponds to the results. And it doesn't give again the results again and again. 
you need to discuss the results, not state the results again. Here, you need to compare your published results by, with, with the previous literature and the references you have used in the introduction. Now, this is important. We always say the discussion like section must be able to link the previous studies, that is the literature, with your own study. That shows that you have worked really well on the research. And never ignore work which is in disagreement with yours. In fact, you must confront it. For example, if some of the research has said that transformational leadership is not good for sustainability and they have their reasons, while well, if your study finds out that transformational leadership is good for sustainability, you must take that and say in the study by so and so, they, their findings reflect that the transformational study, uh, transformational leadership may not lead to sustainability. However, our, however, our findings are in line with so and so, so and so, who confirm that transformational leadership enhances sustainable development. So that's the way you should be able to juxtapose your findings. So disagreements must not be disrespected. Disagreements must be dealt with through citations and confronting with academic arguments. Now, that is very important. Now, generally, what are the pitfalls there? The pitfalls are generally what happens is many times the author repeats the results again in the discussion section. That should be avoided. You must go, discussion section must discuss your results. Then there, many times the implications of the study are also not given in the discussion. Now, every study has got implications and the implications can be of different type. They can be policy implications, they can be managerial implications, they can be theoretical implications. So all implications of the research must be clearly stated. And along with stating the implications, if there are limitations in your study that restrict the impl implication, that also must be clearly brought up. Statement about future research are too generic. So your future areas of research must also be specific. You can't generally say there are many more areas you can do research under for transformational leadership. Many areas are available for doing research in sustainability development. Now, these are generic statements. Instead of that, you should be clearly able to say developing frameworks of transformational leadership to enhance sustainability would be an interesting future area of research or sustainable development in emerging economies and solutions to enhance those sustainable development frameworks are future areas of research. And that is the way it should specifically come out. Now, once you're finished with discussion, or then you come to the results section. Now, results section is also very important because the focus of the results section should be association with your statistical test. Now, two guidelines are there when you write your results. The results must present answer to each of your research question. So it is better to write your results against your research question. That will help in beginning it better. Then you must also not forget to report non-significant association. Many times what happens is when you are giving your research findings, the results, you will see that main things are covered. Some minor things which are more important but bring out the relevance and your fineness of the research gets ignored. So make sure that even smaller non-significant associations are covered. For example, in a study of transformational leadership, when you're doing major variables, you understand that communication is an important variable. And you must highlight that, how communication will alone or communication, proper communication will enhance transformational leadership. So don't assume that people know things. You have to spell them out. And to avoid confusing the reader, avoid abbreviations in the tables of figures, define them. And if you are using abbreviation, first time use it fully in the bracket, you write it. For example, if you are using artificial intelligence, first time you must write it fully in the bracket, you write AI in capital and subsequently use everywhere as AI. And in the key terms, you must define what artificial intelligence you mean. So that there is no confusion about the abbreviation you have used. Now, what are the pitfalls in your results section? 
generally sometimes people feel results will just give statistics now that has to be explained it see what happens is any table which is not explained below becomes a table which is not interpreted by the researcher so whenever you give any statistics make sure the statistics are explained don't use casual words like cause impact inappropriately because as soon as i was explaining you these terms have got technical meaning you must be sure of why you are using them when you are giving your results so if you are saying that this is the cause of this then you must be able to tell what causes what if you say this is the impact then what is that impact you should be able to explain so words like related associate it are more appropriate than cause impact etc the direction of the association also must be clear otherwise if your direction is not clear it becomes very difficult for the uh, people to understand what you want to say so just a minute i'm just changing the slide here just give me a minute Okay. Mm, now this is the uh, result section. Now some additional tips on discussion. How do you do your discussion in a better way? Avoid statements that go beyond what your results can support. So don't make statements which your results are not able to support. Avoid unspecific expression. Like don't say high temperature, lower degree, higher degree. Quantitative description should be preferred. When you say higher, what do you mean by higher? Lower, what do you mean by lower? Avoid sudden introduction of new terms because in the introduction, you must be clear and you must use the same terms. Sudden new terms in the text of the paper can make the paper go imbalanced or unclear and get rejected. Then make sure that the data supports your hypothesis, your results are consistent, Discuss weaknesses and discrepancies if you have discovered in your data. Is there any way, better way to interpret your results? What further research is necessary to answer some of your remaining questions? Explain what is new without exaggerating. As I said, you say that this research contributes in announcing the understanding of this, this, this. Don't over exaggerate, but at the same time, don't be so humble that you don't bring out what is novel in your research. And revision of results and discussion is not just paperwork. Sometimes when you get a comment that discussion is weak, you need to strengthen. You need to really do additional research, additional interpretation, and rewrite the discussion section. If you don't do that, then after revision, your paper will get rejected. To avoid rejection after reviewer comments, make sure that you are serious about how you address the reviewer comments. Now, there is a good diagram about what are the major elements of discussion section. You should have a mini synopsis that is abstract, then restate main findings, significance, compare results, what are the future pathways, what are the strengths and limitations, implications of the research, and suggestions for the future the research. These are the main aspects of research. Now, the next thing what we are discover, going to discuss is abstract. Now, many of you must be wondering that abstract comes first in the paper. Why am I discussing it last? It is because you need to write the abstract last. First, you need to develop the paper and you need to write the abstract last itself. Because an abstract which is written at the beginning is never written in a proper way. Only after a paper or a manuscript is fully developed, you can write a proper abstract. In an abstract, there are two words which are essential. What has been done? and what are the main findings. So an abstract must tell what has been done and what are the main findings. Abstract must be written after the manuscript is ready, though it is the first section in the manuscript. So make sure that you write abstract after your paper is ready. Now, what are the guidelines for peer review publications? Research your publishing op options. Uh, consider what are the options you have. Take time to explore the journals to choose the best fit. Then draft your article, as I said. Read the instructions for the authors. Make your submission. Wait for peer review. Make revisions. Then once your article is accepted, make sure that you promote your published work. 
many times people publish but they don't promote it in the academic circle then that is where then your research doesn't get citations or the research gathers dust so you must it is the job of the researcher to promote the published work also and today you are lucky most of you have got good social platforms academic platforms like academic.edu research gate where you can just you know if not upload the whole paper you can upload the abstract and say this is what you have published this is what you have published there are people who ask you questions so you need to engage with the research you do on a continuous basis so how do you uh, checklist the manuscript quality so i have given the checklist for ensuring that your manuscript has a quality so you prepare a manuscript now how do you know that it is of a certain quality or acceptable quality so please go make sure that you go through this checklist did you write to a specific type of reader that is what is the target of the journal did you allow the introduction guide that is you followed that triangle which is there is there a research aim specific have you included a thorough description of independent dependent variables and other results have you justified methods have you described your results in words that convey the direction does the text summarize key findings from the tables did you avoid repeating results in the discussion and did you present your new results properly so this is what is important for checking the manuscript quality now i have given certain references at the end of this presentation uh these references will help you to use later now with this i have finished the presentation part of it now like yesterday what we'll do is we'll have a frank and free question answer session because answering your questions is more important than doing a ppt presentation because ppt presentation is just to give a little bit of what i say as direction to the talk but otherwise it doesn't help the uh, interaction part of it. so now we the session is open for uh, question and answer we have about uh, 40 minutes for question answers you can ask as many questions as you all want clarify your doubts whatever it is can you all hear me yes ma'am okay. yes ma'am yeah so you want a 5 minute break you can have a 5 minute break and then ask your questions i'm okay with that also um already i have posted on your uh, question ma'am please okay. clarify that I'll, 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 i'll open the chat box yeah both in been another under same right i mean it gives the same meaning right then why should we consider okay i'll just check up huh? maybe by mistake there's a repetition i'll just check it give me a minute slide number 2 main elements okay just let me open the terms slide 2 main elements of introduction section you mean in the diagram or you mean in the this thing in the diagram ma'am fourth and fifth uh, point no no uh, fourth and fifth point is fourth is why is it important to learn this new information that means it is bringing the significance of research okay okay ma'am hello while well, the fifth point is giving your research aim what ma'am the fifth point is research aim okay okay ma'am and the fourth point why important to learn this new information that gives the significance of your research okay ma'am so one is the significance the other is the aim of the research thank you ma'am thank you so much is it clear okay so they are not same okay because significance of your research is the impact your research will have and the utility your research will have the aim of your research is what your research intends to achieve is that clear yeah ma'am clear ma'am okay 
you can even orally ask a question if you are fine typing it a bit uh, difficult if you type also it's okay but you can orally also ask questions that it becomes faster and easier Okay, I see one question. What precautions to be taken while converting your thesis into research paper? Ah, uh, Sheetal. Okay, first of all, the thesis is of what level? Is it a master's level or is it a PhD level? That's the first question. Okay. PhD now, level. Pardon? PhD. Okay. Now, if it's a PhD level, then you must be able to pull out or carve at least three papers out of your PhD thesis. Okay. Because a PhD is never usually with only one objective, one hypothesis. Usually a PhD level thesis has about minimum three to four objectives and minimum three to four hypotheses which are tested. Am I right? In general, usually that's the case. Yes, ma'am. So a research paper, you should be able to carve out a research paper literally on each objective. And then you must be able to separate and filter the relevant literature review for each objective. So your each objective should become like a title for each research paper. Now, let me give you an example. I just see if I have a PhD thesis on my screen here. I'm just minimizing it so that I can give you a specific example. Is that okay with you all? Yes, ma'am. Can you see me still? You can see me and you can hear me. I'm just trying to see if I can open out a PhD thesis in, on my computer screen, okay? So that I can give you an example of it, right? Just give me a minute. Because if I give a specific example, you all will understand. Otherwise, it will be difficult for you all to understand, isn't it? So just let me open this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just opening a thesis so that I will tell you these are the three objectives, how you can have three separate papers on that. Okay. So just to give you an example. Yeah, you can type your questions in the meanwhile. I'm seeing some questions coming there. Okay, I have a thesis here. The title of it was, uh, the title of the thesis was Investigating Critical Success Factors for Implementation of Succession Planning. Okay, this was the main thesis. Okay, now this thesis had got some three objectives. Okay, now I'll tell you how each objective should be converted into a research paper. So let me go to the objective section. Hmm. There is the objective. Yes. Did you hear the title, what I said? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma yeah, it was investigating critical success factors for uh, effective succession planning implementation, for implementation of success planning at a particular organization, okay, in public sector. That was the PhD thesis, okay. Now, there were three or four objectives. I'm trying to get the objectives so that I can tell you how you need to have a paper on each of the objectives. I'm going down to the objectives.
okay the objectives were to identify methods used in filling key positions okay then the second objective was to explore the challenges faced in promoting smooth succession and the third was to explore critical success factors now these were the three objectives of this research now each objective should be made into a separate research paper for example identify the methods used in filling key position so if you want to make succession planning effective then you must first have an exploratory study on the different methods used for filling is uh, leadership positions okay because what is succession planning you must understand the broad research the broad research is that you are creating talent development in the organization you are creating succession planning to fill the positions in the organization okay so the main objectives were to identify what are the methods which are used to fill the key positions then second was to explore the challenges in promoting this succession and third was to identify the three factors so you can you should have three papers separate ones because if you are trying to convert your plb thesis if you try to make your plb thesis into only one paper that paper will become very heavy and it was not suitable for a journal then instead of that it's good to write a monograph monograph like i yesterday i told you monograph is a type of publication which is on a focused area, which is in depth, which is more than uh, four or five papers paper. For example, you can have a monograph, critical success factors for successful uh, implementation, for, for better implementation of succession plan. This can be the monograph. Then you can just convert your research thesis into a monograph of about 75, 80 pages. But if you want it to be converted into a paper, then every objective you must be able to have a paper. Is it clear? Did I answer your question? For the yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah. ma Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Yeah. So, okay. Now we go to, okay. Now, Kevin. Ma'am, after collecting data, how do we know and what type of data analysis method we should be using for data to into our array? See, when you, see, in fact, your data collection is determined based on the research method you are going to use. So it is not first you collect data and then you decide the analysis. No, first you define what is the research methodology you are going to have. So if your research method is qualitative, then you will collect data through interview or structured interview or questionnaires. And then you will codify this data into themes and do thematic analysis. Now, if your research method is quantitative, then you will collect data through surveys through questionnaires but you will codify them quantitatively and then you will use regression analysis invariable invariate analysis or statistical methods for analysis and so it is not that you have to you know first do data analysis no first you need to know which method you are going to use then you collect the data and then you do the data analysis according to the method you have used and then based on that you conclude what you did it is it clear kevin yeah ma'am ah. so first things first okay so you do, don't do data collection first first when you prepare a research proposal whether see even the paper i'll tell you many people feel it like this that okay for phd and thesis you need a research proposal and for writing a journal paper you don't need it no actually even to write a good research paper you need to have a tentative one page research proposal for that paper that helps in structuring it better when i say research proposal what are the five important elements of research proposal the title which will give you the introduction the method which will tell you what research method you are going to adopt. The, uh, the, the limitation, it will tell you what is going to be the scope of your research and what are your uh, significance of the research and the limitation so that it will give you future areas of research. So it's always good to have a one page research proposal kind of a thing, even for a paper you want to publish. So you know what you are doing and what will be the end result. Otherwise, if you do reverse, if you first collect data and then you choose a uh, research method, what if that data is not fitting your research method? 
it will be a problem, isn't it? Because that collected data will go waste. Or you'll try to fit the data. Now, that is not the way research should be done. Okay. First, you must understand to, a, to solve a problem, to fill in a gap or deal with an issue, what is the method you want to apply? Is it clear, Kevin? Yeah, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Vibhu, ma'am, in journals, no, our paper no, no. is reviewed by three reviewers. And each reviewer suggests to include so many changes. Do we need to satisfy every comment, man? Sometimes they tell us to include new objective or change methodology, and it's not possible to include so many things in one paper. What to do in that case, ma'am? OK, a very good question. And this is a problem, genuine problem. Now, what you need to do is, without getting emotional, OK, uh, what you must do is you must uh, tabulate the comments, OK? Suppose there are three reviewers, okay? Each reviewer, you make a table or you make one table saying reviewer one, this is the comment. Reviewer two, this is the comment. Reviewer three, this is the comment. Now, those comments will be usually based on the separate sections of the paper. Am I right? So there will be some comment on introduction. There will be some comment on research methods. There will be some comment on discussion. There will be some comment on conclusion. Am I right? It will be like that generally. So what you do is, Club the comments section wise. Okay. For example, if there is a comment on objective, let us say one reviewer, reviewer, first reviewer, reviewer one says that you uh, refine your objective. Reviewer two says you clarify your objective. Reviewer three says add an objective. Suppose these are the three comments. Now, what you should do is you don't have to jump in and do everything what the reviewers say. That's not the way because the onus of the paper is yours. It's your paper. You must take the onus. So what you must do is under your response to reviewer comments, you must say as per the suggestion of reviewer one, the re research objective has been clarified and refined. Okay. However, the suggestion of reviewer number three to add the objective is outside the purview of the coverage of this research paper. This is the way you must respond. Is that clear? Hello, Vibhu, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I can hear you. Can you hear? Yes, yeah. ma'am, yes, Did you hear what I said? Yes, ma'am. So there is no need to do everything. But when you are not doing something, don't remain silent. They face it headlong and state that why you are not doing it. Okay. okay you, you have a right as a researcher to say that this suggestion is not being considered because it is not in line with the research or paper you intend to uh, complete. Or your okay. research okay. paper is getting distorted. Or it okay. is not fitting in in your research. Sometimes what happens is the research objective they are suggested to add can itself replace your objective by refining. So suppose the way you refine includes a suggested research objective. You can just say, instead of writing so much, you can say, revise the research objective, taking into comments the suggestion of all three reviews. Simple. That means okay. you have clarified, you have refined, and you have also included that research objective. OK? So okay. it depends on how you revise. But you must not ignore a comment. That is very important when you are addressing the review. When you are addressing the review, you must address each comment, whether you have done or not done. If you have done, say you have done. If you have not done, you must be able to say why you are not doing it, because how it will come in the way of your whatever research objective or whatever. Is it clear? Yes, ma'am. In fact, when the way you respond to your reviewer comments sometimes makes your paper fly better. Because okay. if you ignore it and if you don't respond properly, the papers will be rejected. But if you reply appropriately, the paper generally get accepted. That's my experience. Okay. okay I mean, well. many times when the reviewers have said, you must add this, you must add this, you must add this. I've always said, thank you for the comments. Thank you for the suggestions. However, these suggestions are not considered because they may distort the very objective of this paper or they are within the they are outside the scope of this paper okay ma'am that's the way to but make sure your language your words is polite that is important okay okay ma'am okay kelvin ma'am base 
on our title itself we can decide the objectives of our title right or is there a way to identify objective like what is this here you're typing kevin on the title how can you decide the objective your objectives may decide your title it's the other way around isn't it okay ma'am. i mean uh, like it's all about the construction of our objectives that's why ma'am. No, no, no. What I'm saying is your title cannot decide the objectives. Your title will decide the scope of your paper. But objectives, specific objectives you will have to give. And your objectives, when they're summarized, will give the title of the paper. Okay, thank you, ma'am. So when you summarize your objectives, suppose you have three objectives. Like, for example, I was telling the case uh, to explore how key positions are filled, to explore how succession planning is done, to explore what are the critical success factors in succession planning. Now, these are three objectives. When you summarize this, what do you intend to study is you are investigating what are the critical success factors for succession planning. So that is how the title will come out, isn't it? So your yeah. objectives, summary of your objectives or your highlight of your objectives would be your title. Okay. Clear? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 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 Uh, Vibhu, again. Okay. I got a review on my paper. He told me to include experiment methodology and it was not possible to do that in that case. I explained just now. Did you get it? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I got it. So you can say that the what uh, methodology you have adopted, it was more suitable uh, for the data you are collected. You have collected. It's better to put it like that. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Yes, okay. Can you please, uh, we, uh, Kevin, can you please explain us about the formulation of hypothesis in a research? I feel it is very important. Okay. Uh, see, the, the, okay, I will try at it, but hypothesis, I am not a person very much of hypothesis based papers. Okay. But I will give you my uh, uh, understanding, whatever it is worth two cents, we can discuss on it as so well. See, hypothesis testing is good in a lab conditions, but in management sciences and social sciences generally, hypothesis testing may not be the very right approach because hypothesis testing means you are either going for, what do you say, yes or no kind and null testing. And then if you have a quantitative method, you can uh, sort of do hypothesis testing better. For example, let me give you an example. If you are studying impact of motivation on work performance, then it is easy to set hypothesis. Okay. Uh, then you can say hypothesis one, uh, higher motivation leads to better performance. Uh, higher motivation does not affect performance. Uh, then uh, higher morale affects performance. Higher moral does not affect performance. So is it is easy to uh, set the hypothesis H1, H0, where you are doing a quantitative study. But if you are doing a qualitative study, it becomes very difficult to set hypothesis. So hypothesis, uh, formulation of hypothesis should be considered uh, more for quantitative studies. That's my personal view, okay? But then, as I say, researchers differ on this. Many of them argue that even qualitative studies can have uh, uh, hypothesis. So hypothesis testing, when people say, I always feel hypothesis building or formulation of hypothesis is suitable for a quantitative uh, methodology. That's my view. So if you are doing quantitative methods where you are studying impact or you are assessing something or you are studying effect of this on that, these are all quantitative studies. In fact, the title of the paper, the title of the thesis of the paper tells whether it's a quantitative or a qualitative study. Or sometimes it can be mixed, but it's generally clear whether it's a qualitative or a quantitative study. For example, when we talk about influence, when we talk about role, when we talk about um, exploring, these are all qualitative studies. When we talk about impact, when we talk about assessment, when we talk about moderating variable in uh, acting positively or negatively, these are all quantitative studies. So setting hypothesis would be a good for uh, formulation of hypothesis is easier and essential and better for quantitative studies. Is, is it clear, Kevin, what I'm trying to say? 
Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Clear, ma'am. Okay. So if you're doing a qualitative study, then I think you should be away from hypothesis session. Okay. I see another question. Is it mandatory to include grounded theory to strengthen our research? No. Grounded theory is a separate method by itself. Okay. Grounded theory approach is a research methodology and it is meant for qualitative research. And uh, you should not use the term grounded theory in a very loose sense. Because if you are just doing literature review for your paper, then it is not a grounded theory approach. Okay. Grounded theory approach is a separate uh, research methodology of uh, qualitative approach. Under qualitative methods, grounded theory approach is a research methodology, which means that you are taking the theories which are already given, you are going into the depth of them, their application. Then yesterday, what we were talking, it's got to do more with bibliometric analysis of those theories. And then you're trying to understand those theories are grounded on what variables and then applying them. So grounded theory approach is one of the qualitative research methods. Okay. So it is wrong, in fact, to use it to strengthen your research. But if you want to adopt that as a research methodology, it's perfectly fine. Is it clear, Vibhu? Okay, ma'am. Okay, okay ma'am. Sheetal. Hey, I'm interested in writing a research purpose for Springer. Should I follow the same guidelines as discussed? Yes. But you can go to Springer website, choose a journal, and also download their PDF which says guidelines to authors. Okay. In concept, these are broad guidelines which can be used for any journal page. Okay, ma'am. The, the guidelines which are given in this uh, PPTs are just standard guidelines which you can develop your draft manuscript. Okay. What you all can do is, just these guidelines you can develop you can use to develop any good manuscript on any title you have or the research you're doing then identify a journal go to that publisher download that journal aims guidelines or to the author and then uh, make sure that this draft manuscript is shaped up as per that journal requirement then it will be lesser work for you okay okay ma'am because these guidelines are like, you know, it, these guidelines are like formula for you all to do a good research paper. So any journal, you follow these guidelines, it is useful. So your 70% of the work is done with your draft manuscript. The remaining 30%, you must do it journal-based and publisher-based, depending on which journal you want to submit and what are their guidelines. Especially guidelines pertaining to the kind of referencing, word limit, etc. There you need to follow that journal. Okay. Sure, ma'am. Okay. Please explain us about sampling technique to refer Morgan's table. Okay. Uh, well, as I said, sampling technique. Now, uh, sampling techniques, again, differ from qualitative and quantitative. So in quantitative, you have these formulas where you can use that Krajewicz formula or Morgan's table, and you want to extract sample. But in qualitative, usually uh, the sampling is uh, based on uh, you, maximum sample size can be 40, okay, in qualitative technique. Because as per our Creswell, uh, 25 is good enough because by, by, by the 25th sample, in fact, many times at the 20th sample itself, you reach the saturation point. So these techniques of sampling are suitable uh, the formula-based samples are suitable for quantitative techniques. But other than that, the sampling methods, if you are asking whether you should use the total population method, whether you should use random sampling, whether you should use strata-based sampling, the sampling methods can be dependent based on what kind of study are you doing and what kind of population you have. For example, if you want to study on employees' motivation, if you are doing employee motivation across the organization where all levels are there, you want to include, uh, then stratified sampling is better. But generally, employee motivation, you should not do across the organization because what motivates employees at supervisory level is different from what motivates employees at management level. So there it is better to conduct studies itself level-wise. So for example, if you want to do on motivation, you must do uh you know uh, what do you call us uh, uh how to uh, i mean what motivates managers is different from what motivates supervisors 
So you need to do those studies level wise. Then you can have random sample, okay? Or what we call as, um, uh, what we call that um, random sampling, stratified sampling, uh, alternate number sampling, or you can choose department wise sample. But uh, if it is a huge population, then you can have a stratified sample. But these tables and this formula based are for quantitative methods where the population is used and you also need the sample to be of a larger size. Clear? Yes, ma'am. Clear. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, how to identify the journals for publication apart from it? the list of existing scopus or UGC? Uh, I don't have a ready list to share the journal. But like, I, I, can I, I'm typing here the publishers. You go to this publisher's website, you'll get all the list of journals. Shall I type the publishers here? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And all these are what website. So you can just go to their website and go to the journal section and download their list of journals, which are there in the uh, Okay, and then we have publishing in your publishing media. I've just typed, can you all see? Just see if the message has come. Yes, ma'am. Has it come? Yeah. Taylor Francis, Emerald Springer, Indoscience, RGI Global. These are international. Publishing India is Indian. And Publishing India has all the journals which are uh, having UGC recognized. Okay. So, and big advantage for most of you all is Publishing India doesn't charge uh, any uh, publication charges. No, no, what we call as article publication fee or open access fees, etc. Emerald Springer, Indoscience, some of their journals are. Oh, open access, some are what we call standard. So you have to check the journal. Each journal is different. Okay. You just go to this website and you'll get the list of journals. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, now, which question? Where was B? Okay. Good. I'm interested in sampling, how to identify journal. Ma'am, sometimes journal takes two years and keeps our papers and shall we wait for such a long while we draw the, they are not. What is the best way to learn qualitative research? Okay. Now, Vibu, it's like this. If you are a beginner or if you are just writing re now research papers, uh, you, it is better you don't send to such journals where the gestation period is so long. Because I think when you are new, what you are interested is to have a faster Turn around, isn't it? See, once you publish about say 30, 40 papers, okay, then it doesn't matter whether your paper takes one year or two years, okay. Because I think if I'm not wrong, the usual requirement for an associate professor is 30 refereed papers and for professor is 40 papers. Am I right? Something like that, okay, roughly. Am I right? Hello. Hello. Can you all hear yes, me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, ma so, so now, suppose you are aspiring to be a professor or from assistant professor to associate professor. And what is important is you have that number of papers first. So sending to a journal which is going to take two years and all is a bit risky for you. So it is better you don't send there. And if you have sent by mistake, forget about that paper do new papers and get publish them published in other journals. Let that paper take its own time. But if you already have published sufficient for your career growth, you already have, say, 30, 40 papers, then it doesn't matter if you aim for just journals because after a particular number, then that number has got no meaning, okay? Then you must aspire for those 
better quality journals where even if you publish say two three papers in two three years still that papers will have value so that's a decision you have to take based on at what stage of career you are i don't know vibhu i can't see you here uh, are you assistant professor senior lecturer what what where are you now at present vibhu Ma'am, I'm Dr. working Vibhu? as an assistant professor. I'm working okay. as an assistant professor, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Where in Bangalore? Ma'am, in JNK, in uh, oh. my uh, my oh. college. Okay, in JNK, Jammu Kashmir. Okay. You. Yes, I now I saw your picture. You are very young still. I can see your young yes. photograph. Uh, no. So then, in your case, I think it's better you first have certain number of papers which. go for journals where there is a faster you know or turn around cycle at least the paper should get published in one year you know six months one year so that once you have then you can go for this journal because see the length the time taken by journals such long is because they are in demand there is a waiting time you know they have so many manuscripts that your manuscript is put in a queuing system so that means their journal has got that high index and that's the reason why it takes time and then again there is no guarantee that it will be published isn't it so it's better if you ha don't have that kind of time to wait now it's better you hold on and uh, publish first in other journals and then you can think of it that is one way okay and what is the yes, best sir. way to learn qualitative research uh qualitative research is got to do with more with an individual's approach to thinking if you are by nature a person who thinks who has got the ability to introspect to observe then it's it's good to adopt qualitative research qualitative research calls for deeper understanding of the things so more reading is required more thinking is required more mulling over ideas is required qualitative research is not as easy as people think in fact quantitative research is easy that way if you know if you can get the formulas right and do it's easier so one way of learning qualitative research is start taking one or two topics and read about them in depth introspect on them and see what are the areas new dimensions you can add to that topic for example what is the subject you are teaching dr vipul if i may ask ma'am retail management uh, retail ma'am okay now what you should do is you should read i'm sure you teach retail management so what is that which is not uh, according to you uh, well written in retail management or what is that which you feel that retail management as a discipline must improve okay whether the strategies adopted in retail management are good or not or whether the advertisement which are used for retail management are good or not so some areas you must specifically note down and start reading and thinking on them and seeing how they are working in the field okay and okay. then uh, take a good uh, research methodology book on qualitative research creswell is a good book on qualitative research okay if you read creswell and uh, and understand his that onion approach to qualitative research it's a diagram you can put it on google also criswell onion approach to qualitative research and then you read few papers on that and then on apply that to the retail management topics which you are thinking seriously over a period you will refine in research, qualitative research okay okay ma'am qualitative research is got to do more with thinking and observation and Uh, mulling over ideas and application rather than scientific formula application okay that's how it is but these are few ways you can ha uh, okay for qualitative methods how to determine sample size i think i answered this question uh qualitative methods usually the sample of 40 to 50 is more than enough in fact sometimes 20 is also enough uh, sample size because saturation happens after 20 Quality method sample size can be twenty five to fifty. Um, qualitative methods can be again same, similar. You can have a whole population. You can have a strand, uh, what you call the stratified, or you can have a random sampling method. Method you can use any, but the sample size may, can, need not be more than forty for qualitative. Abba, that's what the answer is. Okay. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, uh, can you yeah. repeat that? Any question. Crystal... 
Trisul, you were saying about that qualitative research, we have to refer. Yeah, yeah I will type it. Right, ma'am. Even I won't have to know. Yes. Yeah, I will type in here. OK, ma'am. Thank you so much. That's one. And that is called as onion approach. Onion. You will get it as onion diagram, OK? But it is called as onion approach. Uh, OK, ma'am. OK. Let's press well. I think it is single L or double well. I don't know the spelling may be not be exactly correct, but onion. It is onion diagram. Well, qualitative approach onion diagram. I have typed it there. Has it come? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes ma'am. Okay, just give me a minute. If it is possible, I'll just uh, see if that uh, this thing is there here, right on my computer and share it. Just getting it. Just give me a minute. You can ask your questions in the meanwhile. I'm downloading it. There's a good PDF. I'll see if I can share it with you. Okay. Yes. Re research onion, a systematic approach to. I don't. Can I attach a PDF here? Yes, I think I so can't that. attach it here. I think only you can uh, send messages. You can't attach it. Okay, what I'll do is I'll send it to Professor Datta. He'll send it to all of you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ma okay, ma'am. Or yes, shall I give you the link for it? It is available on ResearchGate. I think I'll give you the link. Okay. I'm typing the link here. Okay. So you can download it directly. Is that okay? Fine. Yes, ma'am. I will put the link in the uh, this thing below. Can you see that? Research gate, research on a systematic approach, designing research methodology. Has it come? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Then you can download that. That's a very good PDF. Even I have read it many times. It's very useful. It is by a Indian author who has done it very well. I mean, he has given a correct this thing on it. But better is a book, you know. I mean, I would suggest you all uh, read the book itself, you know. I mean, Creswell is must if you want to understand qualitative research. If anybody who is interested in um, uh, this thing, um, uh, uh, qualitative, you must read Creswell. That is very useful. OK, if there are any more questions, we can take. Otherwise, uh, Professor Datta, we can say we can stop for the day. It's, I think 5 o'clock nearly. If you all have any other questions, we can discuss.
I think I've answered most of your questions. Is there any question which is left out? No, ma'am. No. Okay. I think uh, we can say bye to each other now. I wish each one of you all the very best. Continue to focus on research. Research is interesting. It's a good hobby. It keeps you fresh. And uh, uh, anything, uh, we, we, I hope I'll meet you all again sometime. And good luck for your future endeavors. And uh, you can uh, keep this uh, PPTs as a reference point for you all. You can use them for developing your manuscripts. And they will be very useful. Okay, for you all in future. Uh, Professor Dutta, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> because we have come to the end of our discussions, question answers, everything. So I thought we yes. can stop now if they don't have. Okay, they want yes. my email ID. So I'm just typing it yes. here. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. And uh, thank you, Professor Datta. We'll be in touch. Okay.